Hello everyone, I'm Nicole Locke, the GCMS Product Manager here at Shimadzu Scientific Instruments. I'll be your moderator today as we talk about pyrolysis and how it is used as a sample introduction technique. Before we get started, just a couple notes for everyone viewing. There are a few items in the webinar console. Each of the items on the screen can be expanded by clicking and dragging from the bottom right of each window. If you're like me, you might accidentally close one of those screens and wonder where it went. At the bottom of the console, there's going to be a widget bar that will open any of the windows you've accidentally closed. In that widget bar, from left to right, first you'll see a yellow question mark. This is for help if you experience any technical issues during the webinar. Next, the blue projector screen is the presentation window. The red film strip next to that is the media player. The purple Q&A is our question box. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and type your questions into the box and submit them. At the end of the presentation, we will be answering the questions you've submitted during both our panel and Q&A sessions. The other blue box is the speaker bios if you want to know more about us. And finally, the green paper is our resources list. In here, you will find links to both the Shimadzu Scientific Instruments and Frontier Laboratories website. The slides from today's presentation and an infographic about pyrolysis. Feel free to download those anytime throughout the presentation. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Nicole, your moderator. Today we're going to talk about pyrolysis as a sampling technique. We'll be starting off with a presentation from Rojim, the Technical and Marketing Director from Frontier, Frontiers Laboratory North America. After the presentation, we will be joined by our panel, panelists for our panel discussion and Q&A. Um, we have William, Global Marketing from Frontier Laboratories, Atsushi, we also refer to as Ichi-san, the Vice President of Frontier Laboratories, and Alan, the GCMS Product Specialist from Shimadzu Scientific Instruments. Before we start the presentation, we do have a couple questions for everyone attending. So, would you like to expand the range of your analytes um, that you can quantitate and identify with GCMS? I'm going to give everyone a couple moments to respond and then we'll talk a little bit about that. It looks like we have a lot of people that are interested in expanding their quantitation range. So second question, thinking about how you are currently preparing your samples today, is there anything below you wish you could reduce? Again, we'll give everyone a, a couple moments to respond. Awesome. It seems like a lot of people here want, want to be able to make uh, their samples introduced a lot faster. Um, let's find out a little bit more about pyrolysis and how it can be used as a sample introduction technique in your lab. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over for our presentation to Rogine from Frontier. Go ahead, Rogine. 
Thank you, Nicole. So now let's start with a brief history of the Frontier Laboratories. Frontier Lab was founded in 1991 by Dr. Chu San. Dr. Chu San, with the support of some of the polymer scientific in Nagoya University, they developed a new technology for the pyrolyzer based on a vertical micro furnace design. And we will talk about the characteristic of the, of the micro, micro furnace in a few minutes. We are a global corporation, and our main products are the, uh, the multi shot pyrolyzer, the single shot pyrolyzer. We also offer a series of rapid screening reactors for catalyst analysis, analysis and also the ultra alloy columns. Our North American technology firm is located in Antioch, California, but as you can see from the map, we have other branches in Europe and Asia as well. Today, we will mainly focus on the multi shot pyrolyzer and, and the GCMS system. So now let's just start with the fundamental of pyrolysis. What is pyrolysis? Pyrolysis is a thermochemical decomposition of organic compounds at elevated temperatures without the participation of oxygen. Typically, this technique is done in an inert gas such as helium. So when you apply sufficient amounts of heat, you break down the organic bonds of your molecules into more smaller and stable molecules, also known as pyrolysis or fragmentation. Then using your MS library, you can identify this fragmentation to the corresponding polymers. I like to point out that it's very important to know what is the sufficient amount of heat that you need to apply to your sample. So what will be the appropriate temperature that you need to set your pyrolyzer furnace in order for you to not underheat or overheat your sample. And I'm hoping by end of today, after going, all, going over this slide, you guys have a good understanding of figuring out that sufficient amount of heat. So now let's discuss how you can extend the material characterization using pyrolysis GCMS. As we know, at room temperature and ambient temperature, the substance can be gas, liquid, or solid, depending on their molecular weight. Some portion of the solid sample, they are soluble in solvent, so you could use your other analytical techniques such as LC, LCMS, GC, or GCMS. However, there is a range of solid samples that are not, you cannot dissolve them in any solvent, so they are insoluble in solvent. And that's where PYGC or PYGCMS comes in place and expands the capabilities of your GCMS. Because not only you can analyze gas and liquid, but you are also expanding the range of solid samples you can analyze using this technique. So there is no need for any solvent, there is no need for any solvent extraction or sample pretreatment before the analysis. You could just inject the solid sample as it is into the furnace. So as I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, typically pyrolysis is done in helium. So in this case, if you look at the top picture from the butan, which is a C4H10, if you apply heat in a prison of air, which means if you're doing combustion, you're actually breaking down this molecule into CO2 and H2O. Whereas when you apply heat, but in a prison of helium, this time in an inner gas, you're actually breaking this molecule into a smaller fragmentation that now you can identify this fragmentation to the polymer. So in case of polyethylene show at the bottom of the slide, you could see that when you apply the sufficient amount of heat in the prison of helium, polyethylene is start to break down into the fragmentation. So that's why pyrolysis is done in an inan environment. But again, it's very important to know that what is the sufficient amount of heat that you need to apply to a polymer. Otherwise, if you don't know how light or how heavy your polymer is, you might overheat or underheat your polymer, and that makes it very hard to identify the fragmentations of the polymer. So to identify the fragments from pyrolysis, we recommend using this book in conjunction with the F-Search and your MS library. As you could see, this is the pyrolysis GCMS data book of sensitive polymers. It has pyrograms, EGA thermograms, the MS data for major pyrolytes from many polymers. Also, it has a few polymers for the condensate type polymers that we use the reactive pyrolysis for.
So we mentioned that when you apply sufficient amount of heat to your polymer, you're actually breaking down your polymer into a smaller fragmentation. So now let's talk about the polymer degradation mechanism. How do they, these polymers break down? Of course, it depends on the type of the polymer and how complex and how mixture your sample is, but they usually go through three different main uh, mechanisms. So they can go through the random fusion, which most of the polyolefins such as polyethylene, polypropylene, and polybutylene, they go through these type of a mechanism. In a random fission, the CC bonds start to break down and they produce in fragments patterns of increasing oligomers. In a depolymerization mechanism, polymers such as polystyrene, which is a good example, the polymer actually thermally degrades into monomeric fragmentation. So you'll see the styrene monomer, styrene dimer, and then the trimer. In a side group elimination, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, is a very good example of this mechanism. In this case, CL, which is a side group, is actually attached to the side of the polymer chain, but it will break before the CC bonds start to break. So CL removes the HCL, it's forming the HCL, and then your unsaturated polyene is start to forming all these aromatic compounds. So they start to form in rings of benzene and naphthalene. So now let's take a look at more detail for each of this degradation. As we mentioned, this is the PYGCMS of polyethylene that goes through a random fission. So in this case, as you could see, this is a pyrogram. This is a flash pyrolysis of polyethylene. The pyrolysis was done at 600 C, and you can see all the fragmentations of the polymer, starting from lower C cavern distribution chain from C6 all the way to C41 in this case. So you can see how the polymer is breaking down random fusion into a smaller fragmentation of alkane and alkene. Now, if you would have used another type of a detector, in this case an FID detector, you still are breaking down your polymer into alkane and alkene fragmentations, but you notice here that you actually are able to see up to C100. So you are seeing a broader cavern chain distribution by using an FID. Again, this has been done in a 600C for a pyrogram and flash pyrolysis. So my point of kind of showing these two slides here is to show you guys how important that is depending on the application you are trying to perform, you need to pick the, uh, the appropriate detector. It could be a PYGCMS FID or a PYGCMS by itself. So this is, again, the PYGCMS of polyethylene. This is from the book that we just showed. In this case, you can see the EGA thermogram on the top, and also you can see the average mass spectrum and the top 10 fragmentation of the polymer. We also talked about depolymerization, and we showed that polyethylene is a very good example of this mechanism. In this case, when you perform a flash pyrolysis, your polymer starts to break down and form a sliding monomer, dimer, and trimer, but you could also see that there are other trace amounts of fragmentation from this polymer as well. This is, again, another view of the picture. And this is the second page for the polyethylene from the picture that shows, again, the EGA thermogram, the average mass spectrum, and all the fragmentation of this polymer. We talked about side group elimination, and that's the example of PVC. We talked about how the CL gets separated from the side group from the actual polymer backbone for HCL, and then your backbone of the polymer it starts to creating all these aromatic rings. These are again more examples for you guys to kind of um, to kind of understand how different polymers they might go through pyrolysis process and what they're gonna uh, create. In, in pyrolysis. But it's very important to have a good understanding of the backbone of your polymer while you're applying sufficient amount of heat, you're not overheating or underheating your sample. So now let's talk about the application areas of pyrolysis GCMS. Pyrolysis GCMS technique ena enables the material characterization of virtually any organic sample by providing detailed information about the composition of the sample. This technique, you can actually use it for identification of complex polymers. It could be copolymers, cross-polymerization, 
volatiles and additives, as well as you could perform failure analysis, contamination, deformulation, and degradation analysis. So this table is a good example that shows the different application that PYGCMS can be used. As you can see, it's a very broad branch of technique and very broad branch of industries that PYGCMS is expanding the application. And that's because it's a very customizable technique and that uh, while providing detailed information, it gives you a very good understanding of how to analyze the additives and the polymers. For example, you could see encoding industry for paints and pigments. It could be in automotive industry, fibers, elastomers. So it's a very broad branch of application. So as I mentioned at the beginning, today we are mainly focusing on the multi-move pyrolysis GCMS system. So as you can tell by the name, it's a multifunctional or multi-shot pyrolyzer, which means that this pyrolyzer allows you to perform multiple analysis on a single sample. So it's a little bit different than the older fashion type pyrolyzer, which you could only perform the flash pyrolysis. So in this case, you could see that you can perform EGA, stands for evolved gas analysis, TD, thermal desorption, hard cutting, HC, PY, flash pyrolysis, and also reactive pyrolysis. So we are telling you guys that you can perform a lot of uh, type of technique, in this case, five mode of analysis using this pyrolyzer. So how would you know how to start? What will be the first step you need to take? So in order to provide a direction, we came up with a map for analyzing the character and characterizing all the components. We always start with EGA, that stands for evolved gas analysis, and then depending on your EGA thermogram, you'll decide the next step, which could be thermal desorption, heart cutting, flash pyrolysis, or reactive pyrolysis, or it could be a combination of all of them. So now let's kind of get into more detail for each of these techniques. So as we mentioned, EGA, evolved gas analysis, is the first step that we always perform. On the bottom left side, you could see that we have a cartoon picture of the EGA configuration. So the big box is your GC connected to the MS. The pyrolyzer is actually directly connected to your GC inlet. And as you could see, there is a cup shape, a kind of figure in the pyrolyzer that shows the sample. So for the EGA, you're actually using an EGA tube. It's not a separation column, it's just a deactivated tube that connects the injection port into the actual MS. So in EGA, you actually put your sample in the cup, then the sample is dropped into a furnace, which is at very low temperature. It could be from 40 or say 100, and goes all the way to the higher temperature, say from 700 to 800. In this specific case, as you could see, we program the furnace from 100 C to 700 C, 20 degree per minute. So as the furnace is increasing, as the temperature is going higher and higher, the compounds start evolving. And on the right side at the bottom, then you are seeing a thermogram, an EGA MS thermogram. The x-axis presents the temperature and the timing, while the y-axis is the intensity and the concentration of your peaks. Also, in EGA, which um, typically runs from 100 to 720 degree per minute, you keep your GC of an isothermal. Also, looking at your EGA now, so after obtaining your EGA, this is the critical information that you can figure out for avoiding to underheating or overheating your sample. So in this case, you can see two peaks. The first peak, which is a smaller concentration, is coming from 100 to 300 that most likely is your additive and your volatiles because they're coming at a lower end of the temperature. Versus at the higher temperature, you can see a most intense peak that corresponds to your polymeric fragmentation. So by looking at the EGA MS thermogram right now, you actually identify the temperature zones that you need to set to the next step, which is the second step. And as we mentioned, there are multiple analysis depending on your EGA. After you obtain your EGA, you could perform a thermal desorption, flash pyrolysis, a double shot analysis, heart cutting, or a reactive pyrolysis. So let's just start with a single shot analysis. For example, the left picture at the bottom, there is a window that shows the single shot, the single shot GCMS or the flash pyrolysis. 
In this case, you actually program your furnace at a very high temperature, and you only obtain one GCMS chromatogram that is containing both additives and polymer. And this is usually, it's a fundamental technique for polymer analysis. So a lot of older fashion pyrolyzers, they use this type of a flash pyrolysis. But again, using your EGA, you need to identify the sufficient amount of heat or that proper temperature. You could also perform a double shot analysis. In this case, you could see that you are actually performing two analysis on one single sample, and you are obtaining two GCMS chromatograms. So the first chromatogram will be for your additives and lighter components, and then the second shot analysis will be for heavier and polymeric components from your sample. Double shot GCMS actually thermally extracts the additive from the polymer. So there is no need to do any of those solvent extraction anymore because by identifying the right TD thermal desorption range temperature into your pyrolyzer furnace, you are actually thermally extracting all the additives. You could also perform hard cutting. That's the picture on the right side. Hard cutting, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but that's uh, usually done for a deformulation and a reverse engineering. It's a very powerful technique where it allows you to thermally slice your EGA thermogram into different temperature zones. So in this case, you can see that even for the additives, you can obtain more detailed information for the additives. So if you have a, imagine you have a combination of additives in a sample, you run your EGA, then you can actually divide the TV range into multiple ranges and identify the additives for that specific sample. Also for polymers, if you have a copolymer or cross polymerization, after you perform the EGA, you can identify the appropriate temperature range and do a heart cutting. You can also perform reactive pyrolysis, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. This is where you usually use it for uh, carboxylic acids, esters, functionality growth polymer, or a condensate type polymer by adding a reagent into your sample. So now let's discuss about the single shot, which we also call a flash pyrolysis. So after you run your EGA thermogram, as we discussed, and on the top right side, that's the EGA thermogram. So in this case, again, your, your x-axis showing the temperature, the y-axis is the concentration. Using your EGA, you can identify that 600C or 550C is the good temperature that you are actually going to set up your furnace so you're not overheating or underheating your sample. Then you'll change your EGA tube to a separation column, and that figure is shown on the left side using a vent-free adapter. Vent-free adapter is an accessory that I'll talk about in a few minutes, but that allows you to easily and quickly switch the EGA tube into a separation column without having to vent your MS and waiting for your MS to be pumped down. Because if you don't have that uh, vent-free adapter, you have to vent your MS first, change the EGA tube to a separation column, then vent for it to be pumped down. But using that vent-free adapter is going to increase a lot of efficiency in your laboratory by just taking 10 to 15 minutes to change this EGA to separation column. But when you change it, now you're going to go and program your pyrolyzer furnace to 600C, and you do a flash pyrolysis on your sample, and you obtain a pyrogram. That is a combination of additives and, and polymers. So now let's discuss about a double shot. So as we talked about, you always start with your EGA, evolved gas analysis. You use an EGA tube, you set your GC of an isothermal, you program your furnace from 100 to 700, 20 degrees per minute. You could still go lower and higher temperature. This is a typical a temperature that is used for EGA. And of course, you are having a vent-free adapter. Then you run your sample, you perform the EGA analysis, and you obtain an EGA thermogram at the bottom. Again, the x-axis corresponds to the temperature, the y-axis is the concentration. So in this case, after obtaining your EGA thermogram, now you want to go to the next step, which means analyzing this peak from your EGA. So you have to change your EGA tube into a separation column, and then this time you start programming your temperature, your GC temperature. So you'll do the first one for the first peak from your EGA thermogram. 
you set the, your pyrolyzer furnace from 100 to 320 degrees per minute and obtain a chromatogram for the first peak in your EGA. We call this a TD chromatogram or a TD GCMS. So you are basically extracting all the additives, but it's like a thermal extraction instead of using a solvent extraction. So to analyze the second peak from your EGA MS, now you do the second analysis, which means you program your furnace at 600 C. This is, of course, a higher temperature, which means that now you're breaking down those heavier and polymeric components into the fragmentation. So you are analyzing a sample twice by extracting the additives from the polymers. This is called a double shot analysis. So now let's talk about hard cutting. So what if your EGA thermogram has more than two peaks? So on the right side, on the top, you can see an EGA and how there are five zones of A, B, C, D, and E. So in this case, if you want to perform a hard cutting, you are actually thermally slicing your EGA thermogram to each temperature zone. So you program your furnace for zone A from 40 to 120, and then you obtain a GCMS run and chromatogram only for that specific zone. And then same thing for zone B, C, D, and E. So this is really powerful when you're trying to do deformulation because it gives you all the information, very detailed information about what's happening in your sample, how your sample is behaving in different temperature zones. We'll talk about that uh, as I go through the system configuration, but on the right bottom, you could see a selective sample or picture. That's an accessory that needs to be done using hard cutting and that allows you to selectively pick and choose which one of these zones you want to analyze. So for example, uh, consider that you are not interested in obtaining zone C. So if you do a sampling off using your selected sampler, you will not send the pyrrolate from zone C into your GC column. So you actually save a little bit of time by not running the GCMS run. So selective sampler really allows you to selectively pick and choose which zone you want to analyze. And if you want to analyze all the zones in your EGA, you gotta check it all as a sampling on. So now about the reactive pyrolysis. So as you mentioned, reactive pyrolysis is usually done for a polymer that have carboxylic acid ester functionality group or a condensate type polymer. So in this analysis, this is very similar to flash pyrolysis, which means that it's an isothermal analysis. Typically, the temperature is 250 to 380. That's a typical temperature. So you use a reagent such as TMAH. You add it to your sample, and that actually allows you to do more identification of the fragmentation for the polymer. So now let's discuss about the system configuration of PY by also GCMS. So on the figure, as you could see, there is a big box that is marked as the GC. And of course, your GC is connected to the MS, so that's your GCMS. And number five is the column inside your GC. And then you could see the pyrolyzer, number two, which is actually directly connected into your GC injection. So there is a needle that goes through the GC septile at the uh, direct connection. So there is no transfer line when you're connecting the pyrolyzer into your GC. Number one is the auto shot sampler. That actually allows you to automate the process. So you could start a sequence of runs, and do it overnight, do it over the weekend, and come back and start analyzing it. Also, if you're doing hard cutting, which means if you're doing up to seven or eight temperature zones, auto sampler will automatically move the cup in and out of the furnace for you. Number three, we talked about this a little bit. That's the selective sampler that is used for the hard cutting technique. Number four is the microjet chiral trap. So this accessory is very useful when you're doing a thermal desorption analysis. This accessory, as you could see, is that the head of your GC column, it uses a liquid nitrogen and it's going to uh, trap and focus all those volatiles and lighter components for you. For example, if you are doing quantitative analysis on reactive monomers, such as cyclopenodiene, divinyl and styrene, this is a very powerful trapping using liquid nitrogen that actually keeps all these volatile components for you. 
We also talked about the vent-free adapter, which is number six, and that allows you to easily switch in between your separation columns or the EGA tube to your separation column without having to wrench your MS. And number seven is your X-Search system. That's a search engine that it, we usually recommend highly in conjunction with your MS system because we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but the X-Search system will provide you with the identification of the big pilot that they not, might not be in your uh, library, current library. So it's four unique libraries. It has the EGA library, the pyrograms for pyrolysis, and also the additives as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Frontier uses a vertical micro furnace technology for the pyrolysis technique. So on the left, you could see a cartoon picture of the actual pyrolyzer. There is a sampler device on top of the pyrolyzer. That actually allows you to do a manual injection. So you could do it, you could use an auto shot sampler to automate the process, or actually you could do a manual injection as well. So your pyrolyzer is directly connected to the GC oven. It's at the end, and it's, uh, the pyrolyzer goes through the separation column, as you could see. The micro furnace design, the temperature range for the 3030D, you could actually program it from 40 to 1050 C. So now let's take a look at how the analysis is done using this technology. So imagine that yellow, a small round uh, type of a picture that presents your sample holder or your sample cup. So you place a little bit of your sample into a cup. Your sample is held in an ambient temperature while your furnace is set into the desired temperature. Say, for example, you want to do a flash pyrolysis, then you set your furnace at 600 C, at 650 C. So your sample is held in an ambient temperature while the furnace is heated. After the furnace is set to the temperature, then your cup is get injected into the furnace, into the, the pyro tube, and it starts the pyrolyzing in less than 20 milliseconds then the pyrolates are all swept onto the GC analytical column. So in this case, you could see that we are actually doing a continuous loop pyrolysis, which means that your samples are held in an ambient temperature, so there is no exposure to the heat or degradation. We talked about this, about auto shot sampler, how you could have it on top of your pyrolyzer that actually automates the process there are 48 spots for your sample, and it's going to enhance the efficiency in your laboratory. Selected sampler, so any temperature zone, as we talked about in your EGA, you can thermally slice it and selectively pick and choose any temperature zone from the selected sampler. Microjet Kyro trap, as you could see from the picture, the microjet tube is actually connected to the head of the GC column inside your GC oven that is then collected to a liquid nitrogen that has a thermal exchange coil, and of course the nitrogen gas is coming into this. So the microjet cryo trap is actually tracking and focusing all those volatiles and lighter components for you. And the lowest temperature it goes is around negative 196 degrees Celsius. At the bottom, you could see the ventry adapter. This allows you to switch the columns or EGA tube to secretion column very quickly in a few minutes. So now let's talk about F-Search. As I mentioned, F-Search is a library for your additives, for your EGA, and for your polymers that we recommend to use in conjunction with your MS library. There is also one more powerful uh, feature of this f -search that allows you to build your own user library. So if you, you could do a lot of uh, analysis on failure and contamination analysis by running your standards and saving those and creating your own user library then to perform failure or contamination analysis on your samples. But uh, as you could see from the figure, the Polymer EGA library and the Polymer PYGCMS library, they are integrated some library, which allows you to integrate the whole chromatogram, GCMS chromatogram, versus the additive MS library on the right side and the polymer pyrolate MS library, they actually allow you to do individual peak-by-peak -peak integration. So 
So now let's quickly go over the sample preparation. How do you prepare the sample for the pyrolysis GCMS technique? It is very quick, very straightforward. In a few minutes, you just use a, some of the sampling tool, depending on a sample. If you have a solid liquid, uh, you just put a little bit into a cup. There is no need for solvent extraction. There is no need to dissolve your solid sample. Any solvent, you could inject it as it is. And then you just put it in the, in, in case if you have the auto shot sampler, it automates the process or you could manually inject it into the uh, furnace. About the weighting of the sample, how much you need to put in a cup, it really depends on what application you're trying to do. Are you trying to do a bulk pyrolysis or are you going after trace amount or a thermal desorption? Typically around 100 to 200 micrograms, that's the recommended, but again, it really depends on the application and uh, what you're trying to accomplish. So here it shows some of the tools that actually helped you for the sample preparation. So for example, the sample prefer or the micro punctures at the bottom, or there's a very, as you could see, kind of sharp needle that allows you to put a sample if you have a viscous or thick liquid in the middle of your cup. So now let's kind of talk about the summary. So the points that I would like for you guys to take away from this slide are the sample preparation. As you guys know, it uh, takes a lot of time to do the solvent extraction or sample pretreatment. Uh, using a lot of other analytical techniques, but PYGCMS really simplified that for you, really expand the capabilities by you are able to analyze a sample as it is. So there is no sample preparation or there is no solvent extraction. You are actually thermally extracting your additives and your volatiles from your polymers. We also talked about the multiple analysis on a single sample and how the frontier multifunctional, that's why we call it a multi-mode pyrolyzer, it doesn't just do the flash pyrolysis. You could actually do a multi-step thermal desorption for analyzing your volatiles and then using the microjet chiro trap, focus all those volatile components. Or you could do the flash pyrolysis, the double shot analysis, which was a combination of TV and PY, or more strongly the hard cutting if you're trying to do a deformulation and also the reactive pyrolysis. And you always start with the EGAMS. That's the first step for you to start. Again, we talked about now you guys should know the answer of how to not overheat or underheat your sample, and that's done by your EGA. So you run your evolved gas analysis first, and then you analyze your evolved gas analysis, and depending on a the thermogram you obtain, you set the appropriate temperature for the next step. So you're not really overheating or underheating your sample. We also talked a little bit about F-Search and how you could use the F-Search to simplify and improve the data interpretation. We have four unique libraries in F-Search, as we mentioned, the EGA, the pyrolates, the additives, but also the ability to make your in-house library. It's a very powerful technique for any type of a contamination or failure analysis that you guys can perform. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the precise furnace of this technology, of the frontier technology, and how you place your sample in equal cup, and then the cup is actually held in an ambient temperature while your furnace is heating to that set point. So you're not really exposing your sample to any heat carrier to the analysis. And that is really what the continuous mood pyrolysis is meant. Also, the furnace is precisely measured with a thermocouple sensor. So if you set your temperature at 600 C, this is really a precise and accurate 600 C at the furnace temperature. I think I'm a little bit over time, but that's all I had, Nicole. So I'll give it back to you. Rajin, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, next, we're going to have a panel discussion, and then we'll follow that up by answering your questions. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A box in the widget bar. We'll try to get through as many as possible with whatever time we have left. So first discussion point, uh, Rogine, I'm going to give this to you. Why choose to do flash pyrolysis over a double shot? Are there specific materials that do better in one technique over the other or a specific application space where it matters more? 
Yes. Well, for the flash pipe, also for a single shot, as I mentioned, this is typically a fundamental analysis for polymers. So if you know when you run your EGA, if you see that the majority of your sample is polymeric components, go ahead and use a flash pyrolysis, which means that you actually set up your temperature to the set point, but you'll get one chromatogram. But if you see additive from your EGA thermogram, then a double shot comes in place because now you actually thermally extract your additive from the polymer. So instead of using a single shot, do a double shot analysis on your sample. Perfect. Um, anybody else have any thoughts about that? Well, uh, I'd like to add one more note. This is E.G. Watanabe yeah. from Frontier Lab. So uh, if the EGA contains more than two peaks, you can perform hot cutting analysis where the EGA thermogram can be thermally sliced into temperature zones for analyzing the components in each zone. And then also uh, you can automate a whole procedure. So all we have to do is to uh, set a temperature range for each peak and then you do just uh, do the hot cutting. Hi, yes, uh, this is Alan Owens from Shimazu as well. I would like to add a point to Ichi San's last point. Uh, regardless of whether you're doing a flash pyrolysis or a double shot or even EGA, each setup is extremely simple and quite intuitive. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next discussion point. William, I'm going to give this one to you. We haven't heard from you yet. Um, PYGCMS versus FTIR is a technique. Um, is one better than the other, or, or should labs really consider both? Uh, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that question because it's one of my favorite ones, and the answer is yes. But that's the simple answer, and they really are complementary techniques. And each one of them supplies different information. For example, FTIR will give you information about what type of chemical bonds you have in your material. Uh, whereas PyGCMS is more like a map, a chemical map of your material. It will tell you about the compounds and structures that uh, make up your material and will give you a, I've heard one person refer to it as a chemical map of those materials. So if you're analyzing complex materials or trying to reverse engineer something, you need a number of techniques, and one of those techniques you definitely should consider is a PyGCMS system because it will provide you with the richest and most extensive data set of all the techniques. But yes, FTIR and PyGCMS are definitely complementary. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Rojin, I'll give this one to you. Uh, what are some differences between the Frontier Pyrolyzer and some other pyrolyzers that are out on the market? Um, while other companies can pyrolyze samples at the same temperature as the Frontier, they don't always guarantee the same reproducibility um, that you guys guarantee. Can you speak to that? Sure. Well, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the, the vertical micro furnace that we use is create a continuous mode pyrolysis. So in this case, your sample is actually held in an ambient temperature. So you're not subjecting your sample to any heat prior to the analysis. When your furnace is set to a temperature that you program it, then your cup actually get injected into the furnace and then the pyrolyte sent to the GC, to your GC column. Versus if you're not doing a, using a micro furnace and using a filament type or a curry point type, uh, pyrolyzer, it's more like a pulse moved pyrolysis, which means that while your furnace is heating up to a set point, your sample is actually getting subjected to some heat. So there is always chance of evaporation and degradation of some of those lighter components of your sample. And uh, another advantage that I could again bring uh, on about Frontier is how you could perform multiple analysis and not only a single shot and how the temperature is really precise. So when you set up at 600, it's the real 600 degrees Celsius. Yeah, and this is William, and I just wanted to add something to that. Temperature is really, really important here. 
for example, a very small change in temperature can change the reproducibility when you're quantitating, so it can shift the ratios of uh, what you're seeing. Um, if you're not quantitating, if you're qualitating, then the say, for example, a difference between a monomer and a trimer doesn't differ so much with the temperature, so it's easy to give a reproducibility spec on that ratio, but it's much more difficult to give a reproducibility spec on run-to-run -run rather than internally. So temperature is really important to consider. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about maintenance. Um, one of the things that we always see, whether it's on a GC, a GCMS, sample introduction, maintenance becomes a concern. Um, are there signs to look for that would tell you when it's time to maintain the unit? Um, Ichi-san, I'm going to send that one to you. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Well, uh, the maintenance, uh, routine maintenance schedule depends on your sample composition and how many samples you analyze each day. So of course, there are dirtier samples and more frequent analysis will accelerate maintenance requirements. So if you notice a change in your chromatographic performance, you might consider maintenance. So the most common maintenance activity is cleaning or changing the pie tube. So whenever you clean or replace the pie tube, which is used in the furnace part, you should change its ferrule as well. It is also a good practice to uh, periodically change the septum as well, GC septum, so that the, you can lengthen the time between PY pie tube replacement by periodically cleaning the PY tube with a Q-tip. Also, this is a good tip when you are running reactive pyrolysis with a sticky devasizing agent such as a TMAH, so tetramethyl ammonia hydroxide. And then also, uh, if you notice shifting retention time, you should leak check the system to rule out a PY leak as a source of the problem. You should also check the needle in the PY GC interface. It can get clogged by uh, improper samples or overloading the sample cap. And uh, it is essential that uh, you clean or replace cups between each use. Okay, ghost peaks or sample absorption are some of the problems that can occur if the cups are not clean. Also, we have the videos for all of these routine maintenance postures available on the Frontier Lab website to help and assist in keeping your system in top-notch condition. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ichi-san. I look forward to seeing some of those videos. Uh, let's do one last discussion before we get to the Q&A. Um, William, I'm going to send this one back to you. What do users who have never done or have never even heard of pyrolysis usually see as the biggest challenge in this technique? Um, I think the biggest challenge is um, the discipline to stick to the method map, and Rougine talked about that and how powerful it is. In the hands of an average analyst, if they use that method map technology or that step-by-step uh, -step way of analyzing the sample, then they can get some very powerful results. And after trouble is, after familiar with the tech, familiarity with the technology, we have a tendency to want to skip. We want to do the easy thing to get the answer faster or um, easier. But in the long run, not using the power of the frontier system kind of leaves the analyst with less information about the sample and the possibility of lower quality results. So we always say to people, if it's a sample you haven't seen before, run the EGA. And you don't have to run the EGA on everyone. But every sample, if you've already run the EGA and it's the same type of sample and so on, you can probably skip uh, the EGA and just use your preset conditions. And the other thing is the F-search. It's a very powerful technique, and it takes a, about an hour and a half to two hours of using it through a workshop that we do to really see how it can unlock a lot of answers for you. So that's what I'd say, the method map and the richness of the technology is kind of hard to get your arms around when you first use it. 
Um, Alan here. Uh, I think one of the other things on the GCMS side of things um, would happen to be the leaks that Ichisan kind of referred to as well as diagnosing those um, as far as seeing that on the mass spec and how to actually troubleshoot those. As rare as they may be sometimes, it is quite difficult to identify certain things or certain characteristics that would signify a leak and then actually solve the problem from there. And I'll just add one additional point there. One thing that people always forget, probably the number one call we get at Shimadzu regarding leaks, especially with the pyrolyzer, is even though the pyrolyzer sits on top of the injection port, there is a septa there, and that is a very high temperature location. So we do have a tendency to see over time that septa does break down and does need to be maintained just like every other part of your instrument. So awesome. Well, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're going to move on to some Q&A that has come in. Uh, first question, uh, what would be the typical sample preparation for extracting additives from a mixture? I can take on this one. Uh, Nicole, as I mentioned on some of the slides, you actually are thermally extracting all the additives and volatile components from your sample. So there is no really any need for any sample preparation or you don't need to dissolve your solid sample in any type of solvent. You could just inject it as it is, place a little bit of sample into the cup and inject it into your furnace. So there is not really a sample preparation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rajin. Uh, next question. Um, how do you decide the appropriate heat for pyrolysis? Um, I guess every sample has different requirements, but how do you actually determine what temperature you should really start with? I, I can take that one. This is William. Um, EGA, that's that's the answer because as you do the EGA, it really gives you that thermal profile of your sample and um, if you're trying to do thermal extraction, you can see the range to do that. If you're trying to do pyrolysis, you can see the apex and you move beyond the apex of the EGA down to where it starts to come back to baseline or all the way to baseline and that's probably a good pyrolysis temperature for you. You don't want to go too high because if you go too high you'll just have CO2 as your answer and, and that's not a very useful answer. So again that's the, the nice thing about the EGA is that it can show you which particular temperature you should set for your pyrolysis or your thermal extraction. Awesome. Thank you so much, William. Um, we've got another question here. This one uh, from Tom. Everything has a thermal mass. What is the weight of the sample cup and how long does it heat up in the furnace? Like to <laughs> Tom, that's an insightful question. Um, and that's one of the beauties of this particular design. Um, there is so much overwhelming thermal mass within the heater itself that when the cup drops in there, it's quote unquote almost instantaneous uh, heating of the cup. So we're talking about a um, few milliseconds for the cup and also the thermal mass of the sample that's in the cup to reach the set temperature that's in the overall, uh, you have this excess of heat in the furnace and it happens instantly, so to speak. So that's one of the reasons I like this particular design over some of the others. Great, thank you so much, William. Uh, we have another question from Jennifer here. Uh, it says, we currently have a Shimadzu GCMS QP2010 Ultra. Thank you very much, Jennifer. With the Frontier Pyrolyzer, the PY3030D, um, there are, are there other detectors that can be put on the instrument? For example, FID, FTIR, et cetera. Um, or would we need a separate instrument? Uh, Jennifer, that answer may be a yes, maybe a no. Depends on what else you already have currently installed on the instrument. Our QP2010 Ultra Series uh, instruments have the ability to have at least one additional GC detector installed on them that will operate with your GCMS solution software. So for example, we see a lot of people with some new ROSE compliance directives 
going down the path of they were doing ECD um, and then now they want to move over to MS. So if you already had an MS but you still wanted to do some ECD analysis, we could definitely install something like that. Um, we also could do a FID. Um, FTIR is a little bit of a different monster, but if you want some more information about that, I can contact you after the presentation. Okay, next question. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for maybe one or two more. Um, besides material characterization, what are some other applications for this technique? William, would you like to take this one? Oh, sure. As you saw from the slide that Rogine put up, there's a broad range of application in many different industries. It, and we talked just about analyzing your polymer, but it, it can be used, we've seen it used on contamination analysis. For example, there was a manufacturer of brakes that had a contamination on their brake pads and we were able to answer that question for them. Um, we've seen another manufacturer that was having their plastics um, failing and all the traditional techniques wouldn't answer the question for them and we were able to show them what was the difference between, you know, sample A and sample B and why it was failing. And, um, you know, the one that a lot of people like that we're a little bit quiet about, but deformulation and reverse engineering your competitor's product is a good way to um, use this technique. Um, Degradation, whether it's thermal degradation or UV degradation analysis, we have an accessory that allows you to apply both heat and UV light to a sample and you can look at what off gas is it and you can look at the change in the composition of it. And of course, comparison of different materials and things like thermal extraction, which makes real easy for sample prep. Um, and then, you know, I, I go back to using the S-Search library which you can create your own proprietary library if you want to do that. And the nice thing about the S-Search is it's de dedicated towards pyrolysis type things. So a lot of pyrolates, pyrolysates, excuse me, don't really exist in nature and the only place you see them is in a pyrolysis. And we have those in our library. You won't find those in an, an NIST MS library. So that's one of the good things about the S-Search library. So I, th I think that's about it, but, um, you know, heart cutting the technique also allows you to identify the composition of the sample with looking at the lights and the additives, which a lot of people use the system for, and the oligomers and the polymers. It's also very good for natural polymers such as lignans and cellulose and other things like that. So it's a, a, a powerful technique. Great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Rogine, I'm going to give this one to you. Um, are there any additional items that can be used with the pyrolyzer other than the auto sampler? Yes, they are. And as we look at the system configuration, there are other accessories such as the microjet cryo trap or the selected sampler or the vent free adapter. For example, the vent free adapter allows you to switch the EGA tube to separation column without having to vent your MS and wait for it to pump down. So it really adds a lot of efficiency into your lab work. Or the microjet chiral trap that uses a liquid nitrogen and it's kind of uh, at the head of your GC column so it's trapping all those volatile components. Or the selected sample as we talked a little bit that is done with the, the hard cutting. So it will give you, you can selectively pick and choose which of the thermal zones of your EGA you want to send into your GC column. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I think this is one of the more important questions of the afternoon. What are the standardized methods for the pyrolysis GCMS? Okay, I'd like to take that question, Nicole. This is it. Sure. So uh, there are some uh, standardization method. For example, STM D7823-16, uh, which is for the analysis of phthalates in plastics. And then also uh, ISO method, we have uh, 7272-205, uh, which is the analysis of the 
thiamine, butathione, and isoprene ratios in rubber samples. And then also the identification rubber, so which is ISO17257, identification of rubber sample for rubber polymer. And recently, uh, we have the new standardized method, ISO slash TS20593-2017, which is the determination of the mass concentration of tire and road wear particles using a pyrolysis jet method. And lastly, uh, this is kind of hot topic in this world, so IEC method, IEC 62321, part eight, which is the, also the analysis of phthalates in plastics in electronic products. And then also, uh, well, we are working on it, but there is an edibles in cannabis method before the uh, ASTN uh, D33 committee. That's about it. Great. Well, it looks like we're just at the top of the hour, so I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and discussion. I'd also personally really like to thank everyone from Frontier, Rogine, William, Ichi Sun for presenting and answering all of the questions about pyrolysis that you know I know a lot about, but some of the things I didn't really know. So thanks for that. Um, if anyone has any additional questions that we weren't able to get to, we will be contacting you over the next few days with answers to those questions. Um, again, I'd like to thank you so much for attending our webinar, um, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>